to be fair to everybody. <laughs> yeah, we've got, I'll start with this. Uh, you know, there's only so much I can talk about in an hour. You know, it's, uh, this is uh, the kind of thing that uh, requires lots of time and, and, uh, and demonstrations and all kinds of things, but we will do the best we can in the amount of time that we have. So, um, welcome. I want to welcome all you folks. It's nice to see you here. Uh, and uh, I want to thank the folks, all the folks at Rocky Mountain that, that put this whole thing together and, and uh, uh, are having me speak. And so, uh, it's good. Education is a good thing. And I think that you're going to find... Uh, I, I firmly believe in education. Uh, and I think that the better educated you guys are about what's going on with uh, speakers and acoustics and all that kind of stuff, the better decisions you can make, uh, you know, obviously enjoy your music more and have more fun with the process. Um, I have to say that I am not a religious man. I believe in the laws of physics, but uh, I've been doing this long enough, in fact, nothing but room tuning since 1993. I was an engineer and a musician before that and started in the studio world in 1971. Um, and I think I've seen enough cases where the rules of thumb that everybody believes in have been not the way the real world actually works. And so, um, so if I can impart anything on you today, it would be to uh, always question authority. You know, let's, let's put it that way. Um, be willing to try something silly or something that doesn't make sense. Uh, don't just you know, follow the rules because uh, every room is its own unique being. Every room, you know, is going to change dimensionally somewhat. Uh, the construction is going to be different. And, um, and all, all of those factors are going to have some effect on the way your music's going to behave uh, in your system. So, here we go. Uh, I think that 70% of what I can accomplish, and this is just a number that I'm, I'm making up, uh, but the majority of what I can accomplish in somebody's room is finding that one perfect spot in the room where the speakers and the listener placement interacts with the room boundaries in such a fashion that you get the most linear response out of the speakers. And I think that's what you really want to, you know, concentrate your time on is... is being able to get those speakers and the listener placed just right, because once you've optimized that equation, then, uh, then you can start to move ahead with things like acoustical treatment. And, and if you want equalization, equalization is becoming more popular these days, um, uh, but I see that as being icing on the cake and unless, you know, unless sometimes it's an issue of, well, you have to move a wall three feet or equalize the system, um, it, sometimes it's more expedient to, to use an equalizer uh, to take care of low frequency problems. But um, uh, the acoustical treatments, we want to go through a process uh, once we've placed our speakers of solving our first order reflection issues, uh, working with room size perception, and, and of course, everybody's problem, low frequencies, bass traps. So, the one word I have for you, which is, sounds like you know, the pool scene from The Graduate, where the, where the guy told Dustin Hoffman, plastics, son, plastics. It's going to be symmetry. Okay, that's, that's the one word I have for you. 
And, um, and when I talk about symmetry, I just don't mean you know, the walls. I mean the placement of the equipment, especially the placement of the speaker uh, and the listener within the space. Um, and the reason being for this is that when you don't have symmetry, you're, you're going to get conflicting frequency responses and phase responses out of your speakers. And in order for us to have really good imaging, I mean, the best imaging we possibly can, the left speaker, you should be able to take a mono signal and play it in the left speaker and pan it over to the right speaker and have it sound exactly the same coming out of both speakers. That's really what we're looking for. And once you can do that, then you're gonna have a center image that's going to blow your mind. It's gonna, it, it's gonna be a really great center image and it's gonna allow you to expand your front to back depth, your sound stage. Uh, you'll be able to listen to individual instrument placements throughout the whole spectrum you know, uh, uh, between left and right. And so that's why it's really important for us to try to, to make the left speaker and the right speaker sound as, as much alike as possible. And, and I'm gonna say this, I'd prefer to have some type of flaw in the frequency response coming out of the speakers as long as I got them to match. You know, as far as priorities go, if I'm, you know, looking at a room, then I, 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 I mean, ideally, I want to give you as linear a pr frequency presentation as possible. Uh, but, uh, you know, if I have to make choices, I'm going to choose for, for imaging rather than uh, frequency response. Because the imaging is going to make things kind of pull side to side, you know, uh, you're gonna, and it's going to pull the vocal a little off center, it's gonna do things that are just gonna be annoying. Missing a note or two isn't gonna kill you, but not having your, your imaging proper, that's gonna be really tough. So, um, so I'm going to give you here, we're gonna solve somebody's problem today, and maybe it's yours, I hope not. <laughs> You know, I mean, but if very, I, I don't know, how many of you guys have a dedicated, let me take this off, how many of you have a dedicated listening room? Oh, wow. I want you all to write to my wife. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, well, yeah, I don't know what your listening room is like, but uh, th that's, quite a, that's quite a high number. I, if I'd known that in advance, I might have changed the program a little bit. But let's just, let's just talk about, you know, some of this stuff is gonna apply and some of the stuff you've probably already taken care of. But obviously, this is not a dedicated listening room. Um, and this is a, a client sent me this plan and um, and there's several things. Now, I, my cursor likes to do really annoying things, so forgive me, but it tends to disappear and then I have to go find it again. So, apartment, uh, living area, kitchen area, and here's his, his speaker set up here. You can see left to right. Um, right next to one of the left speaker, he's got a comfy chair. He's got a seating area, a coffee table kind of in the center, and a love seat. Um, and so, so I want to start to dig into this. This pretty much, like I said, is a worst case scenario, what this guy's got. This green thing is a rug. I don't know if you can read the, the legend down there, but that, that green thing is, is a rug. And then, of course, he's got, he's got windows here, which is something that, that we'll, we'll talk about. So, um, you know, the, I mean, in any room, the very first thing you have to deal with is which wall do I put my speakers on? And now I'm gonna go back to the intro where I said, throw out the rules of thumb. I think that in any room, you really wanna try both walls. Uh, the, the common uh, concept is that you 
put the speakers on the short wall, you know, back them up to the short wall, and that way they have a nice long length, you know, the length of the room to develop the base waves. It's just that it doesn't always work that way, you know, and, and you know, I've, you know, I don't know, 1,500 to 2,000 room tunings later, you know, can say with a fair amount of confidence that once again, you just have to sort of try both ways and see what happens. Um, I, my advantage is that I use a very sophisticated tuning system. It's called a Meyer Sim System 3, and it shows me frequency, phase, and coherence in real time at 48th octave resolution. And so it's a very in-depth look into your listening space and the speakers. And so, um, uh, you just, you know, you just never know. So here's, a, here's a, just simply an example of, of what can happen. The top screen shows the speakers that are, as one would normally assume, on the short wall. And you can see here, uh, the, this, this is 8 hertz to 200 hertz. Um, you can see the frequency response here. We've got... Uh, you know, really big giant hole here down at the bottom end and then a, a fairly good peak just before the speaker rolls off. Um, and one of the things I, I want to talk a little bit about listening too, because the bottom line here is listening, uh, and that is that um, this type of performance of a speaker in the room, the impression that you're going to get I mean, not only do you have a hole, which means that you're missing frequencies, but uh, the phase relationship of the disconnected low end, that peak here, this, this peak here, to your, your mid-base frequencies, there's a serious disconnect in time uh, be, because, of this, because of this hole. And so you wind up with this really late arriving low end that sounds puffy or bloomy or whatever, you know, the popular description is nowadays for this sort of thing. Uh, and that's uh, can be extremely destructive to the, to the listening process. So you want to be able to connect the lowest part of the bass response to the highest part of the bass response so that you can get a nice tight impulse, you know, a, a good, solid, tight, low end, you know, coming off the, off the speakers. So in this particular room, the, we, took the, we took the speakers off the short wall and we put them onto the long wall and uh, we don't get as much bass extension, but we get something that's much more linear uh, in, the, in the performance area. And, uh, and we get something also that's treatable with some acoustical uh, solutions. And uh, th this, uh, this trace above this a hole like this uh, pretty much is not treatable. I, there's things that can help this sort of scenario, but, uh, but generally you get a hole that, that big, and especially that wide. Uh, that's really going to cause you some problems. So, um, so once you've de decided, okay, we're going to put the speakers on this wall, then the question of symmetry starts to come into play. Uh, how do you, you know, how do you get the same performance out of the speakers? And and really, once again, you want all the reflection patterns of the room to be the same coming from both speakers so that you don't get comb filtering uh, and phase cancellation at different frequencies in different speakers. This is an example of a, speak, a guy's room that, um, and, and let me tell you about these screens here. This is, uh, this is um, 8 hertz to 200 hertz shot and this top red trace, that's my coherence measurement, and then the, 
then in this window, we're looking at frequency, and the bottom window, we're looking at phase. And uh, it, you know, it's a linear phase trace, so it's plus or minus 180 degrees. So every time you see a movement from, let's say, at the very bottom to the very top, that's a 360 degree phase wrap. Okay, and then it's just, the, the, you know, graphically this thing's just redrawing. It's dropping down to the bottom and, and, and continuing on from there. So um, it's not as confusing as it looks. But, you know, here you can see we don't have a match in phase because of this asymmetry, you know, which is kiss of death. But we also don't have anywhere close to a match uh, between our left and right speakers frequency-wise. And, um, and so one speaker was about two feet further into the room than the other speaker in this case. And so, I mean, the problem is pretty easy to solve. When you get a, a frequency response that's as good as this left speaker, which is pretty amazing all by itself, then, of course, that's the speaker that you're going to try to match your other, you know, you're going to try to match the right speaker placement to your left speaker. So how are we going to do this speaker placement thing? Um, there are guys at this show that have been doing it long enough that they can do it by ear. Or if you like to play with it and you have a lot of time, uh, it's your room, you get to, you know, take your time with this whole thing. You can do a pretty good job by ear. I, I, I know some, some guys that, uh, like I said, there's some professionals here. You know, uh, uh, you know, Peter McGrath, for instance, has years and years of experience. He can set up a room pretty quickly uh, without you know, doing measurements. Um, generally, uh, like I said, the base frequencies are the most difficult frequencies to deal with. And, uh, and I'm a big proponent of measurement tools. So if you're going to explore this, you know, trying to do this stuff yourself, I'm going to say get some kind of measurement tool uh, that gives you at least 12th or 24th octave resolution. Uh, and if you can see phase, you, you really want to see phase uh, because that has a big impact on, you know, on. Uh, the way you hear the sounds coming out of the speaker. So I'm going to start, typically I'm going to start with the speakers placed symmetrically and the listener in an equilateral uh, placement with, you know, relationship to the speakers. So if the left and right speakers are 10 feet apart, then I'm going to place the listener 10 feet from the speakers. And of course I want him sitting in the middle of the room in the left to right domain. And, you know, uh, generally, you know, I'll, I may start, it depends on the, of course, every room is different with different furniture and such, but I'll try to start with the speakers, let's say a foot to two feet off any boundary, you know, just to see how that starts to work. Um, and, and in this case, and then I'll take a shot. Okay, so in this case, that's our yellow trace. That, this is our beginning trace. And what I'll do is I'll take a shot, memorize that trace, and then we'll try to determine where, now we've got to try to kind of determine where is this hole? What, what's causing this hole? Is this something that's bouncing off front to back? Is it something that's bouncing off of a sidewall? Is this a left to right issue or a front to back issue? Um, and then, and sometimes it's a floor to ceiling issue, which gets really squirrely. Uh, we don't have much control over that. But um, I will start by moving the speakers six inches to a foot in one direction or another. And the same thing with the listening position. You've got to, you know, you've got to start moving that that forward and backward as well because you're always going to want some as close to an equilateral relationship with your speakers as possible to optimize your, your imaging. So um, this red trace shows you, you know, the second placement that worked. You know, um, 
I, there's no sense in memorizing. If you're doing this, don't memorize placements that, uh, that don't work. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. So, and every time you do a placement, you should you know, just mark a corner of the speaker and number it so you can always come back to it. I, won't, I can't take questions at this time, sorry. Uh, it, we'll just have to wait for the end. I'll, I'll never get through if I start taking questions. Okay, so, um, so you want to, like I said, you want to do this in a scientific manner, you know, because you're going to move the speaker around a bunch of times. And so you go, oh, now where was that spot that I thought really, that spot really sounded good? And then, so you, mar you, you take the spots that sound good, you mark them, you know, with a Sharpie and a piece of blue tape on the floor, uh, and you mark the listening position too. And so you just go through this process. So here we've got the second, you know, the second tuning uh, or, the, or the second trace I memorized. And, and we filled in this hole, which is really a big deal. This hole here is a big deal. Now, it's not a perfect world. We wind up with a, a, a hole in, in this range here. Um, so now the next thing to do is to kind of figure that out. And then once again, you, know, you can tell, you can say, well, we took care of, we took care of this guy by going front to back and we created this. Now we have to maybe modify that, but also what happens if we go side to side? So this bottom window shows you what happens when we found a better place and that was we were able to fill in most of this hole here uh, and we still have something going on here uh, and, and a peak in this area, but this is starting to get up. This is close to 200 hertz. This is treatable with acoustics. Um, so uh, acoustical treatments. So we filled this in. This, uh, a, in my world, um, this may look like it's this terrible, terrible hole here, but the fact is that it's not very many hertz wide and your brain will connect through that it, in music, it's not, it's not going to typically stand out as a, you know, as a, you know, a, a big note missing or something. So uh, I, I'm not so upset about seeing something, uh, uh, seeing something like this in, uh, in my charts. Like I said, if it starts to get wider, then you've got yourself a problem. But as long as you've got... I'm using pink noise. Yeah, yeah, the, you're using pink noise. Okay, okay, yeah. Well, you know, yeah, I, you know, some of the systems out there use uh, sweeps, you know, tone sweeps. And um, let me say this, for listening, tone sweeps to me are a big mistake. You know, um, they're, gonna, they're gonna make things, they're gonna miss things and you're, Ears are going to miss things, and, and uh, I, I just don't believe in it. The other thing is, is that the tone sweeps, unless you window, if you really understand the system that you've got, you spend a lot of time studying it, and you do the windowing properly. Don't forget, you have to have a window open long enough to catch the wave frequency that you're, you're, you're trying to measure, all right? and and. And, uh, and then you, but you, so you want to have the windows open for a fairly long time for the low frequencies, but not for the high frequencies. And so you wind up taking snapshots, you take, you know, three, you know, two or three or four different frequency measurements, sweep measurements in order to get the windowing correct. And, but then you don't get a really good understanding of what's going on in the phase, you know, because you have to paste those things together, you know. So, um, so I, I'm, I'm using pink noise, and, and the system I use uh, does, it, it, it actually, in real time, does its windowing and over, does a, a number of overlapping windows and then, and then averages those out. Uh, that's the way that works. So, um, so the you know so the process is 
You know, it's just a matter of trial and error and some education. You know, like I said, I, you know, I can kind of figure out pretty quickly whether my problem is front to back or side to side. But, and, and you're safer also not to do things at angles because then you don't really know which boundary is causing your issue. So I would say, you know, start off just like a checkerboard, you know, kind of make it like a checkerboard of how you're going to control your, your movements. So we've, here we've got this, this trace. It, it's, uh, it's an ex acceptable, you know, in this room. Uh, and then we're going, now we're going to say, well, what are the other issues that, that we need to take a look at it, that are happening? Well, in the picture I showed you, the guy had a coffee table. And um, the coffee table isn't really any different than a wall or a ceiling or floor, except that generally, the way, because it's right up there by your face, you get pretty much a full energy impulse coming off the table. Uh, it can also be an ottoman, you know, leather, leather ottoman. Uh, if you're going to have to have ottomans, I'm going to say fabric. But um, so this short wavelength causes a lot of high frequency comb filtering. And uh, generally that, that's, you know, a coffee table is going to be a millisecond, millisecond and a half of delay time. So and you, as you can see, it simply mixes in and it's such a short reflection it's a short delay that your brain doesn't separate it out as being a, a separate item. You know, you can't discriminate against it. And so, it, it, you know, as far as your, your brain's concerned, it's all coming from the speaker. And like I said, it, it, you know, it's, it's a short reflection. It, and because of the hard surface, it's a you know, glass surface, it's a high or w whatever the surface is, it's a high energy reflection too. So what does that look like in, in the real world? Uh, top window, you can see my coherence is bad because of the reflected energy. Uh, my system's saying, hey, something is happening that the computer's not spitting out. Uh, the microphone's seeing something that isn't linear. You know? So, so it's, it's telling me this, is, this information is bad, and you know, generally because it's a reflection or some type of distortion. Uh, and so we've got these big holes created by this reflection. And when you remove the, the coffee table, the, you look at the bottom trace, and this is full frequency trace. This is eight hertz to 22K. So you can see that now we've got, uh, pulling, pulling out the table, we've got a nice smooth response throughout this. It's actually a really, really good room. So, what do some of these reflections look like, uh, these first order reflections that are coming off your walls and ceiling? Um, I look at them with an impulse response on my SIM system, and this, this, this is zero time, this is where the speaker is, and then you, you go out in time, and, and these are the impulses that are delayed that are arriving uh, post the direct signal. So it's, it, you, separ you ref um, subtract out the direct signal, and then you can see where all, these, uh, where all these reflections are coming from. And so the concept is to have your speaker be the, you know, obviously the most energy in, in uh, you don't want your reflections to be, you know, as, as high, but also, uh, this is about 30%, 30 percent of the energy of the direct signal, and you want to try to eliminate that. And when you do eliminate it, you can come down here and see that that that's been treated, and so you're not going to have to deal with the comb filtering caused by that that wall reflection. Okay, how do I work with the, the reflections uh, and locate them? Uh, I use the, it, the tried and true method, uh, which is the mirror trick. And you guys probably all know the mirror trick, right? Who doesn't know the mirror trick? Everybody knows the mirror, a oh, couple of you, okay. So, so because that, that impulse response 
you can actually see, okay, if we go back, this reflection is like at nine milliseconds, okay? So you can say, okay, I've got a path length difference reflection nine milliseconds from the, you know, from the direct signal. So then you can take your tape measure and you can go out and you can start to measure surfaces where you could say, okay, well, the bounce would be over there. You measure it and you go, oh no, that's too long. You know, that's too long. If, if um, you know, so you, eventually you can kind of figure out maybe where the, the, treat, the reflection's coming from and, uh, and then, you know, you can identify that place and say, okay, I want to put a treatment up over here on the wall. Or you can do something which is called the old mirror trick, which is above 400 hertz this works. This doesn't work for base frequencies because sound acts a lot like light above 400 hertz. You get down into the lower frequencies, it starts to act more like water, you know? So, um, so it's not, not as, uh, it's not as easy to treat, that's, and that's why it's so difficult. The low end is so difficult. So here's a picture. This is my old house. I, it, you know, it's 2D, sorry. I'll like, try to explain this. This speaker is actually eight feet from this microphone. <laughs> so, and the microphone's at my couch, at, at the listening position in, in the couch. And um, because you're, and then, over here, you can see there's a reflection of the speaker. And, uh, and I don't really care about the back of the speaker or, or the side of the speaker, but I'm concerned with uh, when I can see components and depending on the coverage pattern of the, of the speaker itself, the off-axis response of the speaker, um, this is how I'm going to identify the, the signal. And what you do is you, somebody sits on the couch, you have a buddy that sits on the couch, or you do, and you take a plastic mirror, and believe me, you want plastic because you're going to drop it at some point. And so, uh, you know, go to tap plastics and get a two-by-two two plastic mirror. It doesn't cost anything. And you need to slide it along the surface. Now, this is like billiards. This is, we're talking about, you know, particle reflection. So. If you have your finger under the mirror, you change the angle of the mirror anyway on this surface, it's going to give you false information. You're not going to get the proper identification for, for where this goes. So you need to keep that thing nice and flat against whatever surface you're measuring. And you, you or your buddy just kind of slide it along the wall until you've identified both the left and the right speakers. And my trick that I like to do is, you can see I've got a little, <clears throat> a little Aladdin statue up here, you know, uh, from the Disney movie. I, I remixed the soundtrack for that, and um, I got a statue. <laughs> so, uh, so I put something on to identify the left and right speaker on top of the speaker, on the front of the speaker, so that it's easy to go, oh, yeah, that's the left speaker and that's the right speaker. Sometimes it gets difficult to, to figure out what, you know, which speaker you're actually looking at. So once you've done that, you can go, okay, this is a spot I need to treat. I'm a surgical guy. I don't like a room that's got treatments everywhere. Um, I don't think you really need to do it. I want a natural sounding space. I want to walk into a space and talk and not feel like I'm talking out of my chest. I don't want, I don't want anything muffled. I, I think that, uh, you know, as a musician and an engineer, you have a good natural sounding space. Your speakers will sound good in, in that room also. So in, in the case, cases of first order reflections, I want to, I'm gonna put up as small a treatment as I feel is, is the small, let's say this, the smallest treatment I feel is necessary to solve the problem and then leave the natural state of the room alone. And unless the room is like really a mess. And then, but that's, we're talking about reverb time. So that's a, that's a different story. Right now we're just talking about, you know, the speaker performance. So um, I like to absorb 
the first order reflections that are coming from the front of the room. Uh, and um, as I said earlier, you know, don't put up too much of this stuff. Don't overabsorb your room. Uh, because you can actually get to a point where you're absorbing things that you don't want to absorb. You know, I've been in rooms where people have fixed things and then created, you know, some kind of horrifying mid-range problem. And when I started pulling the treatments off their walls, all of a sudden all the mid-range energy came back and the, the system sounded good again. So, um, and then for me, the fusion I like to use more for a sense of space, for trying to, you know, to make the room seem larger than it, than it is. And, and here's why I've, I've, I've come to this conclusion. Um, here's a picture of a, where I, I absorbed and I diffused a, a, a reflection. And this top trace is the absorptive trace. And this is 2K to 20K. So, um, I mean, generally, you're, you need a quarter wavelength to absorb something. So, um, so you know, the treatment that you're buying, you, you, you have to, they're going to, in some ways, you know, it, at some point, their specs, you're going to look at the specs and go, oh, well, it gets down, a two-inch panel gets down to, you know, 200 hertz. Well, it does, but it's not really very effective, you know, so... So you're, you know, you have to take a look at that, and, and uh, whether you're absorbing or diffusing, just remember, you, to really, to really affect the wavelength, you, you get, you got to be in the quarter wavelength depth. When you're looking at 100 hertz, what's 11, 11 foot wavelength? That means two and a half feet of depth to whether it's absorption or diffusion to really have an impact on, on whatever the issue is at 100. So, okay, sorry, I digress. Um, so here you can see this is nice smooth space. Now, the, if we went back to that impulse response that I showed you, and, and you saw the bottom, in the bottom window, that impulse was eliminated whether I diffuse or absorb that, I'm still going to see the elimination of, the, of the, that initial impulse. But when I, when I diffuse, I'm going to see more low-level energy because a diffuser put, takes all of your energy and it breaks it up in, in time. It's, it's like an like ultra-fine phase grid. And it, and it breaks up in time and it kind of sprays it back into the room. So you're retaining the energy there. And, then, and that's why, in this case, you can see we still wind up with this, some comb filtering here. And it's more comb filtering than I like, you know. Uh, so I'm, not a, I'm a realist. I was a recording engineer for many years. I want to... Um, I want to have, I don't want like some kind of weird, super wide, unreal image coming from a, the outside of my speakers. Um, there, there are things you can do to get you know, wider than your speakers or a nice wide image, but uh, the diffusion tends to create this energy space that, uh, that I find pretty annoying. Um, here's another example of, uh, of treating your, your room reflections. The top window here is, um, is an untreated room. You can see the coherence really is terrible. I mean, this is a bad room. And, and, um, and our frequency response has a lot of comb filtering. And once the room is treated, we have a much more manageable frequency response here. Um, I know you keep looking at these things that look you know, super jaggy, but um, these are uh, generally, you know, I, I would want something that's smoother than this on the top end, more like, you know, more like this guy is. But uh, this is a huge improvement over, you know, over what we had to begin with. And you can see that the coherence may, got much better. That means that you'll be able to listen much deeper into the, into the system. So, um, 
So let's jump off of the, you know, some of this high frequency stuff and these first order reflections and uh, get into the base thing. Um, and uh, subwoofers are becoming really popular, so I wanted to talk a little bit about subwoofers. I know a lot, of, I usually do an hour on subwoofers. <laughs> But, uh, but, you know, we're going to do, you know, eight minutes on subwoofers maybe. So how many of you guys have subwoofers with your system? A lot of you, okay. And is this, how many is this, of this, this, these guys, is it an LFE channel or is it integrated into, as, as, into the stereo system? Oh, so, so most of you are, I do, I, this is mostly a stereo crowd. It's, this is, you're, not, uh, you're not using the subwoofer for LFE. Okay, you're using it for base extension or correction or something like that. Okay, All right, great. Okay, so um, lots of reasons to use sub, you know, power, you know, ed, power addition. I, I'm guessing that most of you, that's not that important to you. It is to some of my, hip hop clients, you know. Um, frequency extension, very important. You wanna get down to 20 hertz if you can. Uh, the, the concept that you can't really get a good performance out of your mains in your room, no matter where you place them, you're not, get, you, you know, you're not getting a good, uh, a good response out of the mains. And the subwoofers give you a lot more flexibility and placement. You know, you have to maintain your equilateral relationship with the speakers, and they have to be a certain height, you know. But the subwoofer, uh, if you integrate it properly, phase-wise, with your mains, the, my, my job is to make, make the subwoofer disappear. That you have, the subwoofer is there, but you don't know it's there. That's, you know, that's when I know I'm doing my job right, is when that subwoofer disappears. And so that's, you know, that's the concept. And the only way to really do that is to be able to integrate the phase perfectly, not just at the crossover point, but to, to make sure that it, when you integrate the sub, that it doesn't add a lot, more, uh, a lot more group delay to the whole system. You know, so it remains pretty tight. So, um, so I, you know, I like stereo subs. I like stereo subs, and and the stereo subs um, make it, you know, make it kind of easier to integrate into the room as well. Gives you, just gives you more more freedom, uh, and so um, and so I, that, that's typically what I'm going to recommend to a client. All right, so when you integrate the sub, I mean, obviously you guys are, you guys are looking for something hi-fi, so you're not like jacking your sub up 8 dB, I'm guessing. Um, you, if you, that's the way you like it, that's okay with me, actually. You know, uh, it's a creative process. You get, it's your room, you get to do whatever you want with it. Um, but um, when I start by setting up a room, I'm going to integrate it as a linear extension of the main cabinets. Uh, that, that's the best way to do it. And, you know, and I also need it to be linear in the phase domain also. The really, when you get to the low frequencies, phase is actually more important than frequency. Uh, that's, that's my belief. So um, here, you know, the placement of the sub, you know, it starts to get tough and, and uh, doing this by ear is, uh, I've been doing it a long time and all I can say is I do a lot better job and certainly a lot faster if I'm using a measurement tool. So um, take, take a quick look at this. This is kind of typical of a certain kind of problem. So here's the speaker without a subwoofer. Here's its performance. You can see it doesn't have much bass extension. Yeah, we want to get more bass extension and um, and, and get rid of, we'd like to get rid of some of this comb filtering that's going on here. So in this case, they took a subwoofer and they lined it up in a linear fashion with their main cabinets, which, you know, 
makes, it's a, it seems like a, the right thing to do. You get all your drivers in alignment, you get, you know, you get a good, you know, all the movement of the speakers moving in the same direction in the same time, except that it doesn't really work that way, especially if there's a crossover involved, um, then you're going to uh, have phase issues. And so what, what they did is they lined all these things up, but the problem in this room was that the, they were getting a bounce off the back wall that was coming into the listening position and canceling. So you could see that when they added the sub, they got some more bass extension, but look at every one of these low points in the, in the main, main system. They all correspond because the, the, by having the speaker lined up directly with the main cabinet, it was suffering from the same problem that the main cabinet was. So in a case like this, you want to be able to move the subwoofer around. In, in this case, it would be front to back, and you may want it behind the speaker. You, you, you may want it in front of the speaker, but, but you have to get it out of that same plane or you're gonna wind up you know, it's, with the exact same problem. So here's a pretty good subwoofer alignment um, where we able to integrate it. Uh, top is the, you know, is the uh, no sub and the bottom is w once you've added a sub into the system. So, and this is all done with just proper physical alignment. So, okay, so you've got your room, you've got your subs integrated, uh, but you've still got some frequency issues with the subs, so what do you wanna do? You wanna do some bass trapping, right? Okay, so the reason you wanna use a bass trap is as opposed to just grabbing an equalizer, is that you'll get a more universal fix throughout the room, and you'll get a larger listening sweet spot. Uh, you know, low frequency equalization can be very effective, but you know, um, you're also talking about adding more electronics into the system. And uh, trust me, I've equalized a lot of rooms. Uh, mo almost all the pro studios that I do, all the studios, recording studios that I do uh, have an equalizer because they need to conform to some kind of normalized curve in order to get their stuff to translate so that when you listen to it, you hear exactly what they intend for you to, to hear, you know. So, um, so the bass traps are great because, like I said, they give you a nice wide sweet spot um, and uh, there's a lot of different styles of bass trapping. Um, there's the tuned membranes, which I like because I can go after a specific problem, a specific frequency problem, uh, and uh, tackle that without affecting the rest of the, the rest of the frequency response. There are low profile membranes that work um, that are work in a more broadband sense. Uh, one of the good things about those is typically they're ab about the ones that I work with are about five inches deep, which means in, in, the, you know, in a home environment where you don't have a lot of real estate, um, you could use one of these, uh, one of these plates uh, and uh, the low pro profile membrane plates and just you know, put it up against a wall and you've only taken out about five inches. And, and the way the, it, the membrane works is it moves and turns your base energy into heat. So that's, that's um, not, it's not going to raise the temperature of your room. You can let your tubes do that, you know. So, uh, but it, that's, that's the equation. It, it, takes, it takes this sound energy and it, it converts it into heat. And um, and so then there are the large broadband. If you have tons of real estate, you could build a great big, you know, three foot trap in the back of your room, you know, dedicated a whole bunch of space. The, a lot of old studios, you know, when I grew up, uh, a lot of studios used to have, you know, two, three feet of space in the back that they dedicate to building a big 
bass trap with big pieces of soundboard hanging at various angles with four inches of fiberglass applied to each side and everything would swing and it was uh, you know, a, a lot of work and, a, and uh, a lot of real estate, like I said. And then there are electronic tunable traps. Um, you, you'll never get one of those things set up by ear, I don't think. Uh, I've worked with a few of them. They can be very effective, but um, I, I guess, you know, they're just, they're difficult to set up. And like anything else, remember that the, with the base trap, you have to, if you're get, having a reflection off of a, a boundary, for instance, you want the trap to be at the point where you get the most energy in that wave that's coming back into the listening position. And so you, you have to kind of figure out where the trap's gonna work most effectively in your room. You just can't put it someplace. And I guess if I had a, you know, something that really bugged the crap out of me uh, at this convention, uh, although there aren't too many guys selling acoustic treatments here this year, um, it's that the industry and even the guys who I respect the most that I think have the most science behind their product, because frankly, a lot of these products work, you know, they work okay. But the concept that corners are bad things it's not true. I mean, it's, I've been in uh, probably 30% of the rooms I've been in where they've had a hole at 75 or 100 hertz, and they had corner traps. Uh, they treat, you know, they'd stuck corner traps in. I take the traps out, and the hole goes away. You know, it, you know, it's easy money. <laughs> it's easy money for me. You know, it, 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 but it, every, people are convinced. Oh, corners are bad. Not necessarily. Not necessarily if you, you have to, sometimes a corner should just be a corner. Sometimes you should put a trap in it. Sometimes you might want to change the geometry. You might want to, you know, put a piece of MDF, three quarter inch MDF across the corner, floor to ceiling, so that you create, you know, like take a two, two foot by eight foot piece of MDF, stick it across a corner and just change that geometry so you retain the energy but you change, the, you change the path length difference of the cancellation. So, um, so there are different ways to approach the problem and the only way that I like, when I work with a client, the only way I like to do it is to go in there with, with some tools, uh, some traps and some wood and, and experiment and see what's gonna work best. What, you know, my job, part, another part of my job is that when I walk out the door, the room's supposed to be done, you know. Uh, I mean, sometimes it takes a couple trips, but generally uh, the reason they're paying me is, is for me to solve the problem, figure out what the problem is and, and find a solution for them. So this, in this case, I, I'm gonna show you, um, this is a big success story, this room, had, you know, had a huge problem in, in, the, uh, in the low frequencies. It was centered, you know, right around, you know, between, you know, 60 and 70 hertz. And um, uh, I use tuned membrane absorbers, 70, 70 hertz mem uh, membrane absorbers, and I started piling them up in the corners, in the front corners of the room, and I came, at a point, it came to, I put up enough that no matter how many more traps I put into the room, it didn't do anything more. It didn't help the problem anymore. It was just, that was all we were gonna get out of this thing. But you can see that I got an 18 dB correction in the low frequency performance of this room. And this brings it into a plus or minus six scenario here, which is, is you know, is pretty good. It's pretty good at, at when you're looking at high resolution. And you can also see that by removing that reflection that was coming from the corner and canceling at the listening position, by pulling that energy out, you can see that we also corrected the phase response. Um, the, blue, the blue is the before, obviously. 
and the red is the after. And you can see how rough the phase response is in this area. And here we've got a nice, much more linear performance out of the, you know, out of the uh, subwoofer. So, um, so acoustical treatments can work really, really well for, uh, for your low frequencies, but the, like I said, sci it, it, it's, it's pretty tough to do by ear. Some of this stuff you can do by ear, but um, generally the rooms aren't as well behaved as this one. You can see this room is pretty well behaved, you know, um, other than this big giant cancellation. So let's just refresh ourselves. Um, here is the layout that we started with. And, um, and here's what we ended up with, okay? So we've got the, we've changed the wall that we put the speakers on. We've got the speakers set up symmetrically left to right and obviously front to back. I, I don't think I have to tell you guys that. <laughs> the, you, you don't want the, the speakers different distances from the, from the front wall. Um, the comfy chair is now in the middle of the room, left to right. Uh, I took the couches and placed them symmetrically side to side. Uh, the coffee table is off to the side now, maybe not as convenient, but, uh, but it's gonna be better for the speakers. And then I put some treatments up here. The, these are tapestries, we hung some tapestries, these red things, and, um, and put some, some uh, acoustical absorptive materials behind the tapestry because the tapestry hung out a few inches and we were able to put, it, put a layer on the wall also to make it more effective at lower frequencies. And what's not shown here is, we, and we didn't get into reverb because we, we don't have time for that today, um, but there was all kinds of crap coming out of this kitchen, very live, and I know that I'm, I'm getting the hook here. I can't read, if it says something, I can't read it. Five minutes, okay, all right, great. Um, so, uh, so what we did was we put up a curtain, a medium weight curtain, so that, because when you were listening to the speakers, all this crap was bouncing back from the kitchen and it was, pretty, it was just so live and hard, it was kind of annoying and distracting. So we put up a curtain that ran like from here to here that they could pull to the side when, when they weren't listening. I'm gonna just throw this out too. The windows, the speakers, on the, you know, having the, the speakers on the window side here. Um, once again, it's gonna vary room to room, but that sometimes that can be very effective for letting the low frequency bass escape that's coming off the speaker. Below 200 hertz, your speakers are all pretty much omnidirectional, okay? So sometimes you need that reinforcement, but there are other times where you've got, just got too much bass going on because of the room size. If some of that escapes out the window, uh, you don't have to worry about it bouncing back into the listening position out of phase. Okay, well, uh, not much time. Like I said, you know, our hour really doesn't do us, you know, give us much. That I'm, that's the best I can do in an hour, sorry. Uh, any questions? Uh, yes, sir. There, there's a microphone someplace, supposed to be anyway. Oh, okay, somebody's slacking. Go ahead and, uh, go ahead and ask your question. If you have the speakers with separate components. If you have speakers with separate components that you could do time alignment, how would you do that? Oh. Well, I use the impulse response, you know, I, I look at the impulse response to do that. So my, yeah, my system allows me to line, you know, to look at, uh, my system's like, I have a 10 microsecond accuracy with my system. So I can align, I just shoot the components and then I kind of line them up, you know. It's, if, 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 it's, if, it's, if it's a system that allows you to do that, um, there's others, um, like the Wilson, the, the, you know, the Wilsons let you actually physically move the speakers a little bit. Um, the Focals, the big Focals have a, they have a spine, an articulated spine that allows me to, to time align the two mid-range drivers 
and that you know because it, it kind of gives more of a curve. Uh, so there, yeah, I mean, there's I don't know who else is doing those things, but I can say this: the, the integrating a subwoofer with an impulse response isn't going to work. You're not going to get an impulse out of a subwoofer, really. Um, when you're taking your initial microphone measurements of your like grid pattern for your speakers, I, you know what? I can't understand you, because the speakers are going that way, and all I hear is the reflection. When you're taking your initial measurements for your speakers, uh -huh. are you taking them from a single microphone point, or are you moving that microphone as well? Well, uh, you know, it just kind of depends. I'm going to move the microphone around and see what the room is doing. When I'm doing an initial setup, then I'm going to. Um, then I'm going to uh, use one microphone position. Because if I, if I start throwing that equation in, we're never going to find a good spot. But once we've found a good spot, then we can see how relevant it is to multiple listening areas. You know? And we're talking about a stereo system. You know, you start to get into home theaters, then you have to do diff things differently. Uh, yes, sir. What should we pay for professional analysis of a dedicated sound? Oh, okay. Well, I, I you know, it, it, I charge fifteen hundred dollars a day, plus travel expenses. Okay. So if there's somebody there locally, I think it depends. I, I, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but I, well, I don't hate to say it, but it, but. I'm probably one of the best guys in the world doing this. I mean, I've tuned from Abbey Road in London to Sony in Tokyo and parts in between. Uh, so I'm probably the most expensive guy out there. I wouldn't expect to. Oh, I'm not. OK. All right. Well, tell, tell me how much they're charging you. I, I'll give you a discount. <laughs> But you know, it, it you know, yeah, it's not cheap. But well, especially if you factor in travel expenses. Yeah. This is the last one. Is that what you're saying? Or oh, are we okay? Could you go into your measurement system and how you use it in a little more detail? For instance, where are you when you're where are you when you're taking a measurement? Do you have to move out of the sound field? Oh, it depends. A little more detail. Yeah. Oh, well, okay. So. Um, yeah, I want to be as far out of the sound field as possible. I mean, ideally, I'm in another room. <laughs> so I don't have to listen to the pink noise, you know, or, or you know, have earplugs or headphones on or something like that. So yeah, typically, I, I want to be out of the sound field. Um, I tend to want to know what the furniture is doing. I'm a, I'm a real world guy. It doesn't make any sense to, to, to tune a speaker system with an empty room and then drag a bunch of furniture in. So I want, I want to know what, I may take the furniture out if something's stumping me, but um, I'm going to set the, I'm going to start by setting the microphone up. If you've got an established listening position, I'm going to put the microphone where your head is supposed to be, you know, uh, and stay away from it because we're using omnidirectional microphones. You know, it, the, the microphone's omnidirectional. So if I'm sitting right next to it, I'm going to have some kind of influence on the measurement. One more question. Yes, sir. If you have two speakers and a single subwoofer, are there any advantages or disadvantages of putting the subwoofer right in the center of the room? Uh, yes. He's asking if there, he's saying if, if there's one subwoofer putting, the, putting it right in between the two speakers in the center of the room, symmetrically. It depends on the room and, and the speaker placement. Um, sometimes that works just fine, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the center of the room is really a bad place to put your subwoofer. You know, it, it, it changes room to room, so it's one of those things that you, you have to measure, you know, or listen to. But you know, like I said, setting these things up without seeing the, what the phase integration is, that's what it's all about. How well does that phase relate to the, to the speakers? So, okay, I think that, uh, I think that 
that's about all we can do. Um, and thank you very much for coming out. <laughs>